Hello, everyone. Our work is facing great challenges and at one time also great opportunities. Build the Future is a series of digital talks about research and how research can address these challenges and opportunities. Today, you'll see we have a different set. We are broadcasting from EduCafe, which is an experimental teaching room here at Politecnico di Milano. I am Gianluca Valenti, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's talk about archaeoastronomy. And here we have Professor Giulio Magli, who is going to be today's speaker. And also, I see on the screen, we have Susanna Sancassani, who is going to moderate today's talk. So, Susanna, ciao. Hi. And the floor is all ciao. yours. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, so, we are very, very happy today to be here with the Professor Giulio Magli. Professor Giulio Mali is the director of the Department of Mathematics here at Politecnico di Milano, but he is above all an astrophysicist and a world famous archaeoastronomer. What's an archaeoastronomer? Is, he is a scientist working on the relationship between the architecture of ancient cultures and the sky. And today, the 21st of June, is a very, very special day. Let's discover why and let's listen to a lot of stories that the Stones can tell us, thanks to Professor Giulio Magli. The floor is yours. Thank you, Gianluca. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here today because uh, this is a very good uh, uh, place to discuss about our research lines, to present research lines in Politecnico Milano, and also uh, to uh, show uh, opportunities of study and also of joining these research lines uh, for second degree students and PhD students. So um, the science I'm going to speak uh, uh, about uh, today is uh, called archaeoastronomy. It's a relatively new science. I've been working, actually field working uh, in archaeoastronomy since the last 20 years or so. I'm teaching archaeoastronomy here since 10 years or so. and. Uh, what I usually say about this science is that it is the science of stars and stones. So uh, I would like to give you some flavor, some idea today uh, of why we uh, like to call this science the science of stars and stones. The best way to, uh, to me, the best way to uh, speak about archaeoastronomy is to start from astronomic heritage. Astronomic heritage, what I do I mean by astronomic heritage? Astronomic heritage essentially is m really most of, uh, of our cultural heritage in the world. It's plenty of monuments, even cities here we see the Machu Picchu Citadel of the Incas in Peru. Uh, all these sites have astronomical connections. So astronomic heritage is uh, a set of uh, heritage which as astronomical connections. I will uh, show you in a while what an astronomical connection is, but just to collect a few examples, so this is a Greek pyramid we are going to speak about at the end of the talk today. And uh, this is Angkor Wat in Cambodia, where I've been working as well in field work, the, the most huge temple of, of humanity, Angkor Wat. And uh, we're going to speak a bit about China as well today. So this is, of course, this is the Hall of Supreme Harmony. Forbidden City in Beijing. And uh, since we are in Italy, just two examples from Italy. This is the Pantheon in Rome, and uh, this other one is the uh, Temple of Concordia in uh, Acargas, Sicily. So all of these, um, um, a lot more, are uh, monuments belonging to astronomical heritage. What does I mean? I mean that hierophanies occur in, uh, uh, in such monuments. What is a hierophany? Hierophany is a manifestation of the sacred. It's a connection between the uh, design of a monument, the project of a monument, and a phenomenon which occurs in the heavens. Typically the sun, but not necessarily the sun, but typically the sun. So it is a sort of machine which connects the uh, uh, build feature with the sky, the heavens. And uh, of course it has a uh, sacred 
content, a religious content, which is the uh, aim to, of our gastronomy to analyze. A few examples. He, here is the Concordia Temple in Acragas. The sun rises in, in alignment at the spring equinox, a picture made by our uh, group. This is Yangor Wat, I have shown before. This is the sun uh, which climbs up uh, the uh, central tower of the temple at the spring equinox. Here we are in a tropical zone, so the trajectory of the sun are very steep, so it goes all, almost vertically uh, behind the, uh, the central tower. This is the Pantheon on the 21 of April, the uh, day of foundation of Rome, where this uh, beautiful hierophany of the sun uh, hitting the uh, uh, door of the Pantheon at, uh, at midday and showing, the, in a sense, the power of Rome in the, in the day of foundation of Rome. And uh, this is uh, for perhaps one of the most famous hierophanies in the world, the uh, uh, light and shadow uh, plummet serpent, uh, uh, which can be seen on the Castillo pyramid in Chichen Itza, Yucatan, Mexico. It was built by the Mayas. So just to, to show you a few of these uh, beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful phenomena which occur, which an astronomer may have the chance to, uh, to study and to assist as well. Uh, from the technical point of view, um, the uh, instrument of arc astronomy is the study of the astronomical alignments. To show you what an, arc an, arc astronomer, uh, an astronomical alignment is, I will show you Stonehenge, which is uh, essentially the place where all this uh, was born in the 60th of the last century. And uh, Stonehenge, this is a Neolithic monument constructed in the third, uh, in the third mi uh, millennium BC. The phase, the megalithic phase you are seeing now is about 2400 BC. Uh, for Stonehenge has an axis. This axis goes to, the, uh, goes to the horizon. It crosses one huge stone. Actually, there were two stones. It was a sort of portal for the, for the sun. And uh, when you go to the horizon, you uh, can check that this direction goes to the point when the sun rises at the summer solstice. So the summer solstice is uh, not a chance, it's a, it's a, a choice for the day of this talk, also for other reasons, but this is the first reason. And uh, uh, we can actually see the sun rising in alignment with, with the axis of Stonehenge at the summer solstice. This is a very, uh, these are very famous images. Uh, today, actually, we think that uh, the uh, phenomenon was rather seen in the opposite uh, on the way, on the, on the other way around, this is a picture by my friend Clive Ruggles, which shows the uh, sun setting into the monument at the winter solstice due to the flat horizon, both the phenomena occur. And we think that Stonehenge was rather connected with the uh, world of the dead, of the afterlife, so uh, rather connected to the winter solstice in the Neolithic Europe. But what counts is that you can measure a monument and you can uh, analyze the uh, significance, if any, of uh, uh, the astronomical alignments. So uh, from here, you can start to construct a complete science, which uh, settled only, I think, in the, the last 40 years, not more. Um, why this science is so delicate? Because it, arch astronomy is a discipline in between. In, in between what? In between archaeology, architecture and exact science. So um, you must work always from a uh, cross-disciplinary point of view. You can use whatever um, scientific tools you want. There are so many tools today that we can use. Topographic relief is, for instance, is laser relief and so on. Uh, satellite imagery, digital sky globe, because you need to reconstruct the sky in ancient times, statistical analysis, and so on. So here we have a look at, to the technical uh, part of arc astronomy. This is a rather old-fashioned study we made of the Temple, Temple of Sicily with a standard theodolite. Uh, today there are more uh, uh, fashionable uh, instruments, but just to show you when you work, you, you need to, uh, to point the theodolite at the, at the sun at midday. Maybe it can be hot, I mean, and so on. But um, then you can use satellite imagery. This is an example from China, which I 
will be discussed briefly in the second part um, of a con visual connection between pyramids in China. And uh, uh, you must reconstruct the sky. Why you must reconstruct the sky? Well, if you look at this image, this is a sort of provocation, uh, you see that uh, this, is a, a, this is the North Celestial Zone, the zone of the North Celestial Pole, but you will not recognize it because you see that uh, uh, Polaris, which uh, is our pole star, is in the Ursa uh, Minor constellation, and you see it is very far from the North Celestial Pole. The reason is a physical phenomenon called precession uh, that changes the uh, declination of stars, in particular the uh, position of the North Celestial Pole with respect to the stars, so an exercise could be to understand when uh, uh, the uh, North Celestial Pole was in this way. And of course, statistical analysis is a very simple example of histograms. You can use also uh, more complex instruments. But uh, this is not enough. This is, this is only half of the story. Uh, because you do need uh, whatever you have from the uh, humanities as well. Historical text, excavation data, landscape archaeology, cognitive archaeology at most. So, you want to understand the way of thinking of people. You don't uh, be satisfied, you are not satisfied if you have an astronomical alignment, if you don't show that the astronomical alignment does not occur by chance. And this is the uh, origin of most of what I call, uh, I mean, trash bean archaeoastronomy, and which you can find a lot of that in, in the web. Uh, usually errors, uh, uh, which propagate very fast, by the way, in, uh, especially on the web, uh, come from the uh, missing part, from the part of humanities. So the part of dating, of uh, archaeological uh, uh, remains, and so on. So you must work in this uh, two uh, direction uh, together. If you are able to do that, then you have a science which has huge poten potentialities, at least in my view. Why? Because the knowledge of celestial cycles was a milestone for power. Understanding the relationship between astronomy and monumental architecture means a better understanding of religion and power in ancient cultures. Why? Because any people um, having the power, let's say shamans or kings or pharaohs of the Chinese emperor, whatever, connected their power with the, uh, with the events. It was a simple way, a very effective way to uh, to uh, justify power. I will show you two examples, which are the uh, milestones for the two case studies I'm, I'm going to speak in the second part. The first comes from China. This is Tijan. Tijan is the god of the northern stars. I, I, uh, the uh, area of the northern stars, the so-called purple enclosure, was a place where the images of the uh, Em Chinese emperor's family was uh, living in the sky. So um, Tijan is a sort of celestial image of the living emperor on Earth. And look, where is he? He is in the uh, chariot, and this chariot very clearly is the uh, Big Dipper. So it has the standard form, the same we use in this case of the Big Dipper. So he lives in a chariot which is actually the Big Dipper. So it's very clear connection uh, between the uh, power on Earth, power on the heavens, and um, as architecture as well, because uh, the Forbidden City, the place where the Chinese emperor was living, was uh, conceived as an image of the uh, North Celestial Enclosure. The other example, uh, is uh, another case study, in a sense, is a complete civilization, 3,000 years of civilization in Egypt. This, to me, is a relief which shows in a fantastic way uh, all these connections. Uh, because we see, we have the pharaoh. The pharaoh considers himself a god, so he is actually a living god, Horus. In front of him, we have Sishat. Sishat is the uh, uh, goddess of knowledge. The um, uh, head of Sishat as a star symbol which associates her with the knowledge of astronomy in particular. What are they doing? They are 
stretching the cord. What does it mean, stretching the cord? They, they are setting on the ground the perimeter of a new temple. So the foundation of architecture is a sacred act. Foundation of architecture is connected with the fact that the uh, architecture itself will be sacred, will be a temple. So we have the gods, we have the power, because Pharaoh is a god by his the temporal power which interests to him. We have the ceremony of projecting architecture and we do, we do have the sky because if we look at the hieroglyphs in the wall, uh, we see that uh, the hieroglyph says that they are looking at the northern stars. So they are orienting the temple, looking at the northern stars. So it, you see, it is a complex mix of, uh, uh, of uh, connections which uh, can be studied, can be addressed by um, archaeoastronomy. But, but let me say that, um, at least recently, archaeoastronomy has acquired also another, uh, to me important, I think it is important, uh, role. This role is uh, related to the valorization of cultural heritage and sustainability of cultural heritage. Why? Most of the astronomical, and also topographical alignments, because if you have two monuments that speak each other, we will see example in a while, and they were built to speak each other in a symbolic way, saying, for instance, this is the temple of my father, I want to align with it. Then you must use the, uh, you must use the techniques of archaeoastronomy as well. So astronomical and topographical alignments, uh, many of these are still effective today. What does it mean that they are still effective today? You can experience them today. You can actually go uh, this evening we, we could uh, perhaps pick up a plane and go to Giza to see something today on the summer solstice, which was projected 4,500 BC. Uh, so, sorry, 4,500 years ago. Uh, so it is a key to valorization. You, you can say this uh, monument has an astronomical value. You can enjoy the astronomical value, value going the correct day. And a tool for sustainable development. Why? Uh, because the uh, uh, world is changing, uh, so uh, ancient monuments are relics inside the changing world. And you can build a, a, a skyscraper, I mean, or, or you can um, exit from, uh, from the buffer zone of UNESCO and have a, a new quarter of a town and so on. But if you do that, you could uh, interrupt the alignments, because the alignments are not a matter of the UNESCO buffer, the alignments are a matter of horizon. So uh, to protect the value, the astronomical value, is also a matter of sustainability of uh, such important monuments. This has recently been recognized by uh, UNESCO with the Astronomy and World Heritage Initiative, to which I contributed as well. Uh, you can find these two uh, volumes for free on the web easily. and. Uh, uh, the aim of this initiative is to exactly to, uh, to enhance the valorization of cultural heritage from the point of view of, uh, of uh, astronomy, or astronomy or astronomy. I'll show you two recent very important cases. This is the uh, 13 Towers of Chanquillo in Peru, uh, which uh, acts as, well as, uh, as a true uh, observatory uh, in, of the second century AD or something. Uh, which has been, uh, is going to be hopefully recognized by UNESCO. The other example has been recognized recently is the cave of Risco Caído, which is in the Canarian island. And uh, this has been, uh, has been uh, inscribed in the uh, UNESCO list recently, also for its, for its astronomical value. So uh, I think that this is a, a, an, an added, uh, an added uh, content of arc astronomy, which is going to uh, become more and more important in the next years. So the choice I've made to show you how this discipline work is to discuss two case studies on which I've worked by myself on field and uh, uh, which to me are very, uh, very clear in their, uh, in their astronomical and topographical, uh, symbolic topographical content. The first one is the case of the pyramids of the Han Dynasty. So we are going in China. 
Uh, pyramids in China, uh, so it may look strange, but I will explain in a while why I'm speaking of pyramids of China. For, from the moment, let's speak about Han mausoleums, so the tombs of the uh, Han emperors. We are in the Han dynasty, so it's about uh, 200 BC up to 200 AD, but the uh, monuments we are going to speak about are the Western Han dynasty, which is the first two century BC. So we are immediately after the foundation, the true unification and foundation of the imperial power in China, which was made by Emperor Qin, the famous emperor of the Terracotta warriors. Uh, the capital of the Qin dynasty is located essentially in the area of today's Xi'an. So here we are seeing a satellite image of the area of Xi'an, which is the town, and to the north of the town, we see the carts of the, uh, of the river Wei. To the right of the uh, modern Xi'an is the uh, mausoleum of the Terracotta warriors, so the mausoleum of the Qin emperor. The Han emperors make a different choice and go to the north of the town and construct their mausoleums in the area which is called today Xi Xi'an, it is the area between Xi'an and Xianyan, where the airport is, and it is a, a, an area of very rapid development. The, uh, by the way, the Polytechnic of Milan has a, a building in the uh, Jiao Tong University, which is near Xianyan. Um, the new place of, uh, of Jiao Tong University is near Xianyan. So, uh, in this area, which is today is fully of uh, industries and new buildings and so on, you find these objects. What are they? I call them pyramid because they are actu they're actually mounds, they are Herten uh, hills. But um, they are, they are, it's not just a matter to pick up Hert and pull it there, because otherwise um, water, rains would have dilavated them. So they're actually built. They are, they are built with huge blocks, let's say in this way, of uh, uh, rammed earth. So this compacted earth added with straw with, uh, with reduced humidity, and you build them. And they are very, 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 very huge. They are uh, still today more than 50 meters high and more than 200 meters side base. So these are the tombs of the Han emperors. Let's have a look at a few of them. And you see they dot the landscape to the north of Xi'an. Of course, uh, this picture, these are all pictures that I've taken trying to avoid the inter, inter uh, uh, veining uh, buildings which are there. You see they form a very fascinating landscape. All of them are satellite pyramids which are for concubines, empresses, and so on. So there, there are more than 40 of these objects. Not even one un, uh, emperor tomb has been opened, but there is one tomb uh, which has the funerary pits opened, like the Terracotta warriors. And what has been discovered today is, has been, by the way, musealized in a very beautiful museum projected by a friend of Politecnico Milano with Professor Liu Kecheng. Uh, in, you see there are miniaturistic uh, terracotta warriors, not only warriors, also animals uh, uh, and so kitchens and so on. So very, very nice uh, funerary equipment, but not of the sites of, which is life sites essentially of the uh, terracotta warriors. So what we can say about uh, these monuments? Uh, this is a picture which I made from the uh, top of the Gaozu pyramid. To the left we see a few of my Chinese students in Jodo. And uh, uh, you see, there is a huge, actually, twin pyramid to the horizon. And uh, when you go to the uh, top of the pyramid of the sun, of these two people, these, these two people are, are um, the emperor and the empress, so they are uh, parents. When you go to the top of the pyramid of the sun, as we are looking here, you see a sign of two mountains. You see, there are no, of course, there are no mountains, it's completely flat. So the mountains you see are pyramids. And you see, you align the base of the uh, pyramid of the sun, you see another one here, more in the foreground, and the sign at the horizon. This sign is symbolic, it says 
I built here because I am their son, I am legitimated to rule. So uh, this kind of connection is a topographical connection which can be discovered by archaeoastronomy and must be, in my view, uh, maintained because it, it is part of the original project of this monument. Another example is the uh, picture I've shown you before. This is a connection between the pyramids of, of An Yanling, which is another pyramid with satellite ones. They form geometric uh, connection. You see the, uh, here very clearly that buildings are, um, are besieging the uh, archaeological area at risk of, um, of uh, making in danger the sustainability of the landscape, if, if not of the monuments, but of the landscape of, uh, of the uh, tombs. Very rapidly, what our astronomy says about the young pyramids, uh, well, there are two families. A very clear one is oriented to the cardinal points with high precision. The uh, Chinese astronomer, astronomers were very accurate, and you see this huge squares in the uh, satellite images are the Ann pyramids and the north is, uh, is parallel to the um, side of the screen so they are very perfectly oriented but as you see here but we discovered that there is another family this family let's call it skewed uh, pyramids the no north is remains on the side so uh, you see these are uh, huge complexes which are oriented some uh, 15 degrees to the west of north. There is no doubt that there is no error here. It's, it would be easy to, see, to say that uh, the Chinese astronomers were making 15 degrees of error would be just crazy. So, um, so there must be a reason for this. And this made a lot, a lot, I don't know, but this made sort of rumor on international press because uh, um, uh, Polytechnic of Milan group discovers the skewed pyramids. They, in fact, they are not skewed, they are perfectly side-based square, but they are not oriented to the north. And so these are, are skewed pyramids which we discovered, and the uh, explanation is astronomical. We're entering into details, but as I said before, there is a precession which moves the north south, south pole, apparent mo movement of the north south, south pole. So um, the pyramids which are to the north are to the true celestial north, the other probably are to the position of Polaris in ancient times. Polaris was not coinciding with the north celestial pole. The north celestial pole was not coinciding with Polaris, so they, you have these two uh, families. Uh, speaking about um, archaeoastronomy of Egypt will take us perhaps 10 years, but uh, uh, so I just pick it up one example. And this example is a thing which is going uh, actually to occur in a few hours. So uh, that's why I pick up this example. This example is what I call the horizon of Khufu. Uh, horizon will be clear in, uh, in a moment. Khufu is the uh, pharaoh, this, the build, Cheops in, from the Greek, is the uh, builder of the Greek pyramid in Giza. Giza is today a uh, sort of outskirt of modern uh, Cairo, on the western side of the uh, Nile flood plain. And uh, the, you can discuss a bit about the date, but uh, to fix ideas is uh, 2550 uh, BC. So the thing we are going to see were constructed uh, more than 4500 uh, years ago. Uh, let's go just to, for a while to the Giza Plateau. Uh, it is a plateau because on the rocky uh, steep over the Nile flood plain, so the pyramids were not flooded by the Nile. Today the Nile does not flood anymore, of course, because there is the Aswan Dam. But uh, in ancient times, all the Nile flood plain was flooded. So uh, this is, by the way, the true key to the construction of the object we are going to say now, because uh, uh, the uh, production of the uh, state economics was overwhelming. And this was uh, a true possibility to permit people to build the pyramids. The pyramids were not built by slaves, were not, uh, uh, not at all, were not built by peasants, not at all. They were built by specialized workers. And specialized workers were uh, fed by the state. So the state was so healthy that it, they could afford huge, very huge uh, 
state project. These projects are the tombs of the, of the pharaohs. And the hugest one is the Great Pyramid of Khufu. It's still today is the, I think, the uh, widest uh, uh, object ever built on planet Earth. It's about 8 million and a half tons of stones, uh, about 2 million to 100 blocks of stones for, uh, for a weight of 8 million uh, and more. It's still today is about uh, 146 meters high, uh, 230 side base, and so on. So you, you can speak a lot about the uh, uh, accuracy and seriousness of the builders at Giza. This is the second pyramid, uh, uh, which is um, the tomb of the second son of Khufu. Uh, the first son, Jedefra, uh, chose another place called Elbrush. And um, uh, in front of the second pyramid, we just a, a bit uh, smaller, just a bit smaller of the Great Pyramid, but it is steeper, so it looks, it looks greater, actually. Um, you see, of course, the Sphinx, uh, which is uh, uh, this famous statue, but uh, it is uh, built on a rock knoll. It is, uh, it is not a movable state, a statue. That will be impossible. It is more than 50 meters length, the body of the lion. So it, it was sculpted from a rocky knoll. And uh, the third pyramid of Giza, the Mankaura pyramid, is much smaller, but not uh, less beautiful. It's, uh, it, it has a, a lot of uh, details. Uh, uh, for instance, it was uh, partly cased in granite and so on. So um, let me just uh, insist on the fact that these are monuments which were built by very serious people and uh, uh, there is no mystery in the pyramids, but there are a lot of enigmas, and such enigmas are coming from the fact that they were very, very serious, and we must be serious as well when you study uh, pyramids. For instance, um, uh, here we see the uh, north base of Khufu. It was perfectly, otherwise it was impossible to build it. And it was completely encased in whitish limestone. So uh, the pyramids were shining in the sunlight um, before the uh, casing was, uh, was uh, picked up in the Middle Age. So uh, we see today uh, the pyramids as sort of bare objects. There, there are no uh, this white casing. And this is a south-west uh, uh, aerial image of Giza that shows the uh, topography there. And um, this is a very famous topography because the pyramids align along uh, 45 degrees uh, uh, diagonal, which you can see here. Uh, this has been, uh, has been uh, this has generated a lot of theories, uh, rumors, uh, and uh, uh, strange things. Actually, I do believe that the reason for the uh, topographical uh, structure of Giza is uh, symbolic, but uh, it has nothing to do with astronomy. It is rather a connection with the Temple of Heliopolis, which was the place where the cosmology of the ancient uh, Egyptian, especially the Old Kingdom, was uh, codified. So uh, if you make the exercise to pick up Google Earth and prolongate this line, it will cross the area of the Heliopolis Temple very precisely. Uh, although it, uh, it is very, very far, more than 50 kilometers far. So they were very, uh, very accurate surveyors. And in making surveys, they were using astronomy. This is the instrument they were using, so called Merquette, sort of, of cross fork, uh, helped with an assistant. And they realized a very impressive accuracy. You see the accuracy in the orientation of the Great Pyramid. It's about three arc minutes, these are not degrees, they are uh, arc minutes, so uh, you pick up a degree, div divide by 60 and pick up three parts. Think how small is such an angle and how small is such an error. If I would ask to my architecture students today to make such a uh, small error, they would think I am mad and they would probably be true, because it's an accuracy which today is unuseful. So we are going to close this talk, and there will be, I will need many hours to speak about the connection of, the, of Giza with the events, but I will show you just one. Um, however, 
as an uh, idea of list of what is there, let me show you the pyramid text that uh, speak about the uh, future afterlife of the pharaoh in the heavens. There are so many of these. Uh, first of all, the doors of the sky, which are open for the pharaoh, the imperishable stars wait for the pharaoh. Imperishable stars are the stars that do not set. So they are the stars near the North Celestial Pole, again, as in China. Then you have an image of Osiris in the sky, which is Orion. So another uh, destination of the pharaoh is in the southern uh, sky. Then you have Heliopolis, and the text says that all the family, a family which starts from the sun god Ra, because the pharaoh says is a direct descent from the sun god Ra, starts, starts in Heliopolis. That shows the topographical alignment. And finally, the pharaoh will join the sun god Ra. They will cross the sky together, united in the darkness, ready to rise again together. Where was this thing to happen? It was to happen in a place called Aket. Aket is usually translated as horizon. Okay, is an, is translated as horizon, but it's a symbolic horizon. It's a place where the dead are prepared to join the heavens. So it's a place of transformation in Egyptian religion. Now we are going to see what happens today in Giza, and we are going to see that it was conceived to make an explicit realization of this uh, phenomenon. We are looking west from the Sphinx Terrace, so we are looking to the main uh, two pyramids of Giza. The Sphinx is in front of us. The Sphinx was called Oremaket, Horus in the Aket, Horus in the Horizon. Let's see why. The sun is going to set today. This picture was taken at the summer solstice, of course. And, of course, the sun moves at the horizon during the year, like a sort of uh, red ball, which is going to uh, set in different places in different days. But today, and the days near, of course, the uh, sun is going to set precisely at the center between the uh, two main pyramids. You see, uh, this is the uh, maximum of the phenomenon, the sun is just about to set and forms an image which is made by two mountains. These are artificial mountains, in fact, but two mountains and uh, the sun in the center. Why I'm saying that this is a hierophany, and to me is the, perhaps the most spectacular hierophany ever discovered in arch astronomy, maybe other can be discovered, but this one uh, may be the most spectacular uh, discovery. Because the name of the uh, Khufu complex, each, each pyramid complex had a name, the name of the Khufu complex was precisely Aket. The uh, funerary complex of Khufu was called the Aket of Khufu, the horizon of Khufu, and the hieroglyph that uh, uh, is translated Aket is made by the sun between two mountains. So, in a sense, for, from, sorry to repeat it again, but it's important, from 4,500 years, more than 4,500 years, every year at the summer solstice, the name of the Khufu complex, the fact that Khufu is going to join the heavens, is replicated. And to me, this image is perhaps also the best way to conclude this talk. Thank you very much.